many of you already know Tim and remember him from his reading of poetry for us back in the good old days when we could eat lunch in Ashland Hall and <laughs> gather for enrichment in person. Okay? But for some of you, <clears throat> you're new to Tim today, so you're really in for a big treat. Tim Conroy, the poet and a former educator, in 2017, Muddy Ford Press published Tim's first book of poetry, Theologies of Terrain, which was edited by the Columbia, South Carolina poet laureate Ed Madden, and just talked about by Duane. Tim is a founding board member of the Pat Conroy Literary Center that was established in his brother's honor, and he's a resident for the time being of Columbia. <laughs> So um, now I think uh, without further ado, I'll go ahead and turn it over to my buddy, Tim Conroy. Go for it. I'm going to, when he begins his PowerPoint, I'm going to mute everybody. Uh, and before I really turn it over to you, Tim, I'm going to say for an uncluttered, more uncluttered view, you might want to go to... Um, speaker view, which would you can find at the top right if you're on a PC or at the top left. And that way you won't see everybody. You'll just see Tim and his presentation. So I'm going to mute you guys. Uh, Tim, you got to unmute yourself. OK. So that should be me unmuted. I want to thank so much Peggy Hill and David Hill and Larry Brown for uh, helping me with this presentation. In fact, Larry got me straight with the technology and Peggy and David are gonna read some poems for you today. So I really appreciate them and, and thank you for being here and thank you for letting me spend time um, with you. And you know, I get to spend time with the memory of somebody I loved very deeply, the memory of my brother, Pat. And you know, I know that as I spend time with somebody I love, but I also send my heart out to the people that you love and lost um, along the way, al along this journey of ours. I want to introduce you to my brother Pat's great love of poetry through the uh, stories and poems and the poets he loved. Excerpt from Tell Me a Story by Robert Penn Warren. Tell me a story in this century and moment of mania, tell me a story, make it a story of great distances and starlight. The name of the story will be time, but you must not pronounce its name. Tell me a story of deep delight. This is a story told about how Pat emerges as a writer told alongside his favorite poets. It's a story about how a writer emerges through a love of poetry and words, how a family uses poetry for solace and comfort. The poets of the world occupy a place of high honor in my city of books. Pat would write in my reading life. His bookshelves on both sides of his writing desk. In the photograph there, you see his desk. Um, and beyond, through the windows, you see Battery Creek, the tidal river that he loved. Also, he would write in My Reading Life, poets candle the pilot light where language hides from itself. I like poets to light their fires, granting me permission to begin my work for the day. Each day, my life begins with a poem that will unloose the avalanche of words inside me. That secret ore that once polished will sit before me disguised as Earth's jewelry. The Boo, 1970, Pat was age 25. He was 25 years old. It was a self-published book. The Water is Wide, 1972. He was 27 years old when he wrote his nonfiction masterpiece. The Great Santini, 1976. 
I was in my second year of college. He was 31. The Lords of Discipline, 1980, he was 35. The Prince of Tides, 1986, he was 41. Beach Music, 1995, he was 50. Pat Conroy Cookbook, Recipes of My Life, is 1999, he was 54. My Losing Season, 2002, he was 57. South Abroad, 2009, he was 64. My Reading Life, 2010, he was 65. Death of Santini, his sort of non-fiction uh, circle of, of life that he sort of completed the story. Was He was 69, A Low Country Heart was, Reflections of a Writing Life was published after his death in 2016. He was working on uh, another fictional book when he died. His literary legacy, but that ain't his legacy for me. For a long time, I thought I was born into a mythology instead of a family, the death of Santini. This is the family photograph, the family and the counterpoints um, that we had. Um, you see the God of war in his dress whites, the great Santini. We refer to him as the beast. My beautiful mother on the other side, just you know, a rich intellectual life who had to put up with the physicality and the violent nature of my father. In the lower row, next to my father, my brother Tom, the youngest. I'm sitting next to Tom with the little pointy hair and the military glasses. That's a Pensacola, Florida suntan that you're seeing, a rare thing on an Irish boy. Behind my mom, my brother Jim, in his Coke bottle glasses, in the red coat, the poet of the family, Carol. My brother Pat in the middle, my sister Kathy next to Pat, my brother Mike. The truth of the family, Pat carried all the weight of my father's expectations on his shoulder. Jim and I, with our Coke bottle glasses, would never be marine aviators. Carol and Kathy, they were women in a patriarchal system. You know what I mean. The girls meant nothing to my father. Meant nothing. And I think they suffered the most for that. My brother Mike, uh, in that back row next to Kathy, behind my father, was too short for the starting five. My father counted on Pat for his legacy. There's a picture uh, on the left side, the photograph of Carol and, and Pat as children. And then you see Carol and Pat as high school students and my youngest brother, Tom, and I'm in the back with my arms around Carol and Pat. Pat and Carol had a fierce love for each other and a fierce sibling rivalry. Pat and Carol would tease each other using this poem. She faci el gran refuto by the 20th century poet C.P. Cathafy. To certain people, there comes a day when they must say the great yes or the great no. He who has the yes ready within him reveals himself at once. And saying it, he crosses over to the path of honor in his own conviction. He who refuses does not repent. Should he be asked again, he would say no again. And yet that no, the right no, crushes him for the rest of his life. Carol and Pat at an early age would say the great yes. This poem would enter my imagination. And of course, I would say the great no to my desire for, to write for the longest time. I tell you this, the first thing a writer must do is have conviction, to have the courage to say the great yes. To paraphrase Seamus Heaney, the Irish poet, imagination presses back against the violence of the world. And I think that's why Carol and Pat fled 
to poetry. Carol's first collection of poetry, The Jewish Furrier, would earn her a fellowship at UVA, UVA uh, where she worked on her next collection, The Beauty Wars. Two of her poems from The Jewish Furrier were published in the Paris Review. This is a video about how mom would influence Pat. My mother got it in her head sometimes during her childhood that she was gonna raise a writer, a Southern writer. The first thing we did when we moved to any new town, and God, we moved to a lot of new towns. Library cards, each one of her kids. We'd go there once a week. And at that time, one library card got you five books. She would choose her five. The requirement was to read them all the next week. The following Monday, we'd be back. And mom won the contest in every library we ever came to of the woman who read the most books in a year. I never knew a person reading a book with that kind of passion. She showed me from reading the first novel that there was a simple relationship between life and art. And I think the library was just for Pat and for a lot of kids, and the librarians know this, for a lot of kids from abusive families, a library is a safe place. It's a quiet place to go. Uh, we moved to Buford in 1961. Buford High School would be his 10th school he attends. He had attended St. Paul's, Sacred Heart, St. Ignatius, St. James, St. Anthony's, Blessed Sacrament, St. Michael's, Gonzaga. It's impossible to name them all. He carried a secret with him, a secret our family had to keep. Our father was physically abusive, men mentally abusive. And Pat, as an adolescent, was searching for the type of human being, the type of person he wanted to become. He came to Buford and he really made it his home. And, and mom encouraged this completely. Excerpt from The Drunken Boat by Arthur Rambo, translated by Wallace Fowley. And from then on, I bathed in the poem of the sea, infused with stars and lacent, devouring the azure verses where, like a pale, elated piece of flotsam, a pensive drowned figure sometimes sinks. The tidal river takes Pat in. Buford becomes his home. He latched on to Buford like a barnacle. At Buford High School, he meets people. He meets incredible teachers and an incredible principal. He would write about the principal, Bill Dufford. I was in the middle of a childhood being raised by a father I didn't admire. In a desperate way, I needed the guidance of someone who could show me another way of becoming a man. It was sometime during the year when I decided I would become the kind of man that Bill Dufford was born to be. Pat Conroy, a low country heart. By the way, Bill Dufford lives five blocks from my house. He's 95 years old, still doing great. English Four, his teacher. Millen folded, and this is Millen Ellis, wonderful man. Folded kindness over me like a shawl, he comforted Pat when Pat would come home from the trips from the Citadel. As Pat put it, Millen was a wonderful teacher. Uh, there's a line in my losing season about Millen as being one of his favorite teachers. He had teachers, you know, that were great, that really lit his imagination. Gene Norris, another teacher, um, taught his students a language that was fragrant with beauty, treacherous with loss, comfortable with madness and despair, and a catch word for love itself, Pat would write in my reading life. He had a teacher uh, before Buford that was also just incredible, Jesuit priest, Joseph Monte. He had at Gonzaga High School that introduced him to a book list that Pat would go through of the hundred great books. 
uh, Monte, Bill Dufford, Gene Norris, Millen Ellis really influenced. And there was yet another teacher along his path that made such a difference. The, the woman in the photograph, Ann Head, was his creative writing instructor. And Pat wanted to take her class, but dad told him no. He said, no, you're not going to take that class. You don't need it to become a Marine. So they had to, he took it in secret. He took it, took that class without dad's notice. Uh, they, it didn't show up on the report card. They just did it. They conspired to get around the great Santini. And up in the left-hand corner, that you can see the photograph of Joseph Monte visiting, visiting Buford. He came to see the Pat Conroy Literary Center in Buford. And um, he, it was, he's still doing fine. He's an amazing man. Great teachers uh, guide students, light their fires. Uh, they gave Pat an introduction to literature and language that was impactful, lasting, and magical. He would say about Joseph Monte, uh, I want to thank you for teaching me so well. No other teacher lit me up from the inside as you did. You steered me toward the life I was meant to lead. I praise and love you. Anne Head is an interesting story because she was a writer herself and she had many famous authors, author friends who wintered in Buford and, and uh, like Samuel Hopkins Adams, Somerset Moyne, John Marquand, and Catherine and E.B. White. So he had these great teachers. He was accepted in Buford. He accepted the place of Buford. The environment was so beautiful, but also the students he met along the way. He got acceptance uh, from. Pat joined the Breakers Literary Magazine. Uh, you know, he, he was a, a star basketball player. He became the senior year president of his high school class. He began trusting something inside him more. The German poet Rilke expressed it like this. The future enters us in order to transform us long before it happened. And so he's writing poetry and he writes this poem, which is an example of what a high school poet would write, right? The Silent Inquisitor, and this is gonna be read by David. The picture of my bureau stares at me with hollow eyes of doom. For all who enter, it compares the constant fall and rise of men within the fragment of my room. So I remember writing poetry in high school and Kitty knew my father and mother well. And I made a mistake in high school because I thought the name Pat Conroy made me sound like an Irish bus driver from the Bronx. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, my mother was once interviewed by a reporter and they said, Ms. Conroy, when did you know Pat was gonna be a writer? And my mother, who had great dramatic flair, said, I knew it when the word nurse brought that little body and I pressed his head to my eyes. And I said, Mom, if you knew it so early, why don't you name me some great like Rutledge Ravenel? And she said, you've never understood the elegance of simplicity, son. Well, the mistake I made in high school I started to write poetry, horrible poetry, just dreadful. And I started writing this in high school, and I wrote one poem, and they published it, and I was so happy, it was my first publication, and, and I think I was a freshman or sophomore, and it came out, and I was delighted, and it, you know, my God, it was horrible. I came across it recently. It's, uh, it does more for the death of literature than for its life than anything I've ever seen in my life. So anyway. That's, you know, so I also signed it, D. Patrick Conroy. I was under the sway of the great Gatsby, and I loved F. <laughs> Scott. <laughs> so I signed D. Patrick, and I thought from then on that would be my name, but y'all would be coming to be Patrick, D. Patrick Conroy's wonderful talk tonight. It won't be fun to talk to D. Patrick himself. <laughs> so I really was very, very excited about this. My father sees the poem. 
Would D. Patrick pass the salt? <laughs> Would D. Patrick ask old dad a biscuit? Will D. Patrick... It was the last time D. Patrick has ever been mentioned on the face of the earth. So he writes other poems in high school. And one of the poems he writes, and I know you can't read, this is his, his print. Uh, but to set this poem up, his best friend um, in 1962 uh, was a baseball player, a star pitcher for the Beaufort High baseball team. And he was at the first home game, the starting pitcher. And he, and he died of a, sar a sudden cardiac event on the pitcher's mound as Pat was in the outfield. Mm -hmm. And uh, this poem is for Randy Randall. And this poem will be recited by Peggy. I have ceased to wonder at the rapid flight of days. The slice of birds and winter's shout are but an effort meant to render nature praise. Myself, I wish to think about a hundred friends who walk a pathless street alone in search of lost and youth grieved dreams. Once a boy, fluid limbed and not quite fully grown, gave love to life, and life, it seems, surfeited with the honey tooth of perfect joy. Yet darkness lit another place far off in the hills. So shadow wrapped the boy in death and pressed his guiltless face into the flawless pages of eternal rhyme. A snow fleeced lamb of the earth and God bound child of time. Uh, that poem would be included in this collection of first words that was collected and edited by Paul Mandelbaum. And some of the other people in this um, collection would include uh, the poet Rita Dove, Gore Bunnell, um, and also a story by a 14-year-old John Updike. And John's name will come up later on. But Pat would write, I like it very much that my first urging toward art came at a time when a friend died and my heart was broken. And I wanted to drop a note to the world. This poem means a great deal to me and lets me know what kind of boy I must have been. I wish I'd been a better poet then. No, I don't. So the great English teacher of Pat's life, another one, Jean Norris, arranges uh, a visit uh, for Pat uh, at Hampton and Plantation with the poet, this great South Carolina poet laureate, Archibald Rutledge. And during that visit, um, Rutledge invites po uh, Pat to come into a study, look at a poem he's working on, and walk the grounds with Pat. Um, and, and so Pat learns from Archibald Rutledge that, you know, get the details right. It's not just a butterfly. It's a, you know, it's a, um, a swallowtail butterfly. It's not just a rose. It's a Cherokee uh, rose. The details, always the details. So in that visit, Rutledge asked Pat, do you prefer poetry or prose? And Pat responds clearly, I want to be a poet, sir. And so as a good English teacher would do, Jean wants Pat on the way back from Hampton Plantation, uh, driving back to Beaufort to tell him what he learned, what was the lesson. So, you know, Pat tries to tell him about the details and this is what I learned. Um, you know account 16-year-old, that's not what you learned. Archibald Rutledge just shows you how a famous writer treats a boy who has the same dreams he had when he was a kid. And, and Pat pledged to Gene that moment that he would try to treat every kid that wanted to be an emerging writer with the same respect and dignity and patience of Rutledge. And I think Pat tried to do that all his life. This is a, another poem written when Pat was in high school and it's sort of a typical military brat poem. The title of this poem is Back on His Shield and this will be read by David. Screaming bullet wedged in flesh, pressing soldier, browned in mud. Rivulets of fear in mesh, 
trench, a reservoir for blood. Mother's snapshot soaked in red, staring at his mangled breast, going then where leaders led, wrong, but right or near, they guessed, shipped like cargo back to her. Tear burned scath casket, claims her own, says to someone, thank you, sir. And this would be after Pat graduates from high school. And remember, just to recap, I mean, he has found his home. He has found his geography. He's had these great teachers that he's met along the way. He has been shown another way to love by these great English teachers, these and principal William Duffer, Bill Duffer. Uh, he has been accepted by students. He goes off, you know, he was a star. To remind everybody, he was a star um, high school basketball player. And this, you know, Pat's not tall. And he could jump maybe six inches off the ground. <laughs> and so he didn't have physical attributes. What he did have was dogged perseverance. He practiced every day, every day. He shot uh, a million um, uh, free throws and dribbled and dribbled, and he willed himself to be as good as he could. So he gets to the Citadel, and he's on a basketball scholarship. And during his plebe year, the fall of 1963, he would write this poem that's going to be read by David. There it is. The dreams of youth are pleasant dreams of women, vintage, and the sea. Last night I dreamt I was a dog who found an upperclassman tree. So you can imagine this did not go over real well with the upperclassmen, who <laughs> made it a point to visit Pat several times uh, the rest of the, the week, at the, and, and it lasted quite some time. But what kind of happened that was sort of unexpected is they gained an appreciation of the courage it took to mess with them, to mess with the whole padre. Now, later on, he would add a verse to this, to his book, The Lords of Discipline. And I'll read the second stanza. Um, he would alter the first stanza slightly, but I'll read the second stanza to you. The dreams of youth are silly dreams of toads and other lowly species. My cadre is a special breed of strutting, screaming human feces. So he had a way with words. He goes on while he's uh, at the Citadel. His, the next year in the Shaco, he publishes a poem called Dallas. This poem is written after, sometime after the assassination of JFK. And Peggy's going to read this. The eyes are vacant echoes of the street, which the ghost of rumor twice has fled. Some babbled words are spat by shuffled feet that say, but for a moment, we are dead. The ebbless strength of time is fiercely dealt upon the flaunted brow of honored men. The time-swift stroke that all have keenly felt has ushered swollen thoughts into the wind. Frame window faces stand alone and stare at autumn's shank of shadow gilded fears. What hollow waste of greatness lingers there concealed within the lethargy of years. I mean, you can definitely see that he has an ABAB CD CD rhyme scheme. There's some iambic stresses. I mean, he's getting a little better, and it probably there's some Rutledge, Arch, Archibald Rutledge influence, too, um, perhaps in that poem. So this is a uh, remember Pat is this you know basketball player. Mom sort of introduced Pat to John Updike, who um, wrote this wonderful book Rabbit Run. And whose um, protagonist in Rabbit Run is a basketball player. Um, and so, you know, he knows of John Updike and he's, he gets fascinated by John Updike's poetry. And John Updike has this poem called Ex Basketball Player. Look it up after the presentation because Pat completely rips it off. 
in his poem, Ted Lucas. And I'll read this poem. Ted Lucas crouched like buried driftwood as the ball emerges from stillness, round and angry in a world of sudden strides and fevered stops. As the ball fell in the nervous grip of Ted Lucas, his final game, the loud clamor of a thousand voices screamed into a dead arena, forgotten by history and all except Ted Lucas, who fought through the rushing mob of rabid souls. He was a god among them, a lion in their midst, almost an event, but that was a glimmer of moonlight forgotten by all except Ted Lucas. The work bores him. The boss moved here from another town and never read the clippings which praised him. Recollections linger as does the plot of time against Ted Lucas. So what's the adage? Uh, good um, writers borrow, great writers steal. And this is definitely an example of that. So Pat graduates from the Citadel. Not many people know before he went to Defusky, he taught two years at Beaufort High School, uh, 1967 to 69 as a teacher. Um, when he comes back that first year, Ann Head is still working at Beaufort High School teaching creative writing, but she would die that first year. He was, he was back. And every time Pat would publish a book, he would take a rose, to uh, the gravestone of Ann Head and drop the rose down and thank her. But she was only 52 too, it's tragic. Um, he had said the great yes. He had found the place, he had great teachers along the way. Uh, he had found there was another way to love. Um, and guess what? His desire at this time was to still be a poet more than anything else. He was still trying to figure it out. He was growing more and more frustrated. And so this is this handwriting. I know you can't read this very well. I'll read this. Not a poet yet, a silent voice looking for a single ear. But I see things that must be recorded. The sad eyes of students arranged alphabetically before me. Then notebooks dry and cracked with school smells. The smells, remember the smells, the wooden desk with freshly carved initials, shit on this poem. Now, to me, if you've ever written in a journal and, and practiced journal writing, and Pat, as a, um, as a formal practice, would write in a journal every day, this is just a typical uh, uh, entry into a journal when you're trying to figure out what to write, how to do it. So later on, he would take a trip after that first year of Buford High School with some friends. They would go off to Europe. Uh, his good friend, Bernie, George Garbay, Mike Jones, and Pat. And this next slide shows uh, Pat's on the left. George is uh, a guidance counselor in the middle. Um, Bernie's on the right, and Mike Jones is an Episcopal priest who's taken the photograph. Um, this poem, Bernie, is going to be read by David. The bright crystal cruets of your smiling gave refreshment in a land of desert people, and the world sings, a bird-heavy world, all cymbals and chime. And children clap to tambourines hysterically mastered by his circus chimps. And the symphony begins here, a maestro with a silver laugh who sings an aria of gladness, a face of singing morning, and the ballerinas dancing only for the love of the dance and the world. And I must point out that um, a lot of this material um, was taken from the Urban Department of Rare Books and Special Collections at the University of South Carolina, which uh, holds Pat's papers. Um, so it's if you ever want to do deeper research in any of this, they have all the stuff there. You know, this is remember, this is 1968. Uh, Pat was born in 45. So he's 23 right now. You know, I, I think 
of all the things I've talked about, a writer needs also friends and companions to keep them honest and feed their soul. And these folks would be lifelong friends. And you know how important that is. On this trip, uh, Pat would write a letter back to Bill Dufford. Uh, and the letter would be like a love letter to, to this principal. And part of the letter, here's an excerpt. It is important for you to know this effect you have had, and I believe you know it, but in the shortness and horrible brevity of life, I want to get everything said, everything. Someday I will exert the same influence over someone and I want him to tell me this is immortality. For what I have learned from you, I will pass on and it will be passed on and it will be passed on and passed on. You know, it's just a remarkable um, closing of this letter to, to his great principal, Bill Dufford. And I think it's a, a, how a 23 year old uh, person uh, wrestles with big questions. Um, and this is his, part of his legacy to me is this sort of thing, not his literary legacy. So this is Pat's good friend, um, Tim Belk, who was a teacher at USC uh, in Beaufort, the Beaufort campus, taught music. Uh, and Tim would go to Savannah and hear James Dickey read from his uh, collection of poetry, 1957 to 1967, which is an amazing, collection of poetry. And this collection would change Pat's life about how he viewed uh, poetry and poets. Excerpt from The Lifeguard by James Dickey. In a stable of boats I lie still from all sleeping children hidden. The leap of a fish from its shadow makes the whole lake instantly tremble. With my foot on the water I feel the moon outside take on the utmost of its power. Bell could introduce him to the lifeguard, the performance, the leap, all these great poems, uh, and, and it would just capture Pat's imagination. And so Pat goes to Defusky as a teacher. He takes that job, and he's still searching for ways to become a poet. In his first few months, he tried to write poems, um, you know, he, he wrote in The Water is Wide, I often fantasize myself as the world's greatest undiscovered poet, living in obscurity and high, biding my time until the seeds of greatness germinated and I would cast poems to the world. I turned to poetry and for the next year I ground out poem after poem. They rolled off the beltway like doomed Etzels shimmering with adjectives, golden with metaphor, moist with youth like embryos, like babies glistening on birthing tables. All this time, I was desperate to find out how a young writer begins his career, what marks the beginning of the ritual when a human is transformed into a writer. I needed a name or a telephone number. I would wear a beret, practice transcendental meditation, fight bulls in Spain. I needed a formula, but most of all, I needed time. So even after he had written the manuscript for The Waters Wide, even after he knew it was going to be published, he wrote this letter to James Dickey. He gets a reply from James Dickey. The original letter I never could find. I would love to find just how much he sucked up to James Dickey to get this response. But this was dated um, in 1972. Dear Pat Conroy, thank you for your recent note and for the things you were kind enough to say about my work. If you want to sit in one of my classes, it's fine with me but you'll have to take care of the administrative details with the English department or whoever handles such things. Sincerely, James Dick. Pat would write in my exaggerated life, 
I loved his poetry more than anyone else's, and I so wanted to see if I could be a poet. Dickey told me I was not a poet in the class. He broke the news to me by saying, you're not a poet. You know, Pat would write, I found that I couldn't live with my mediocrity as a poet. So I turned to prose as both an act of surrender and self-knowledge. James Dickey had issue, issued my marching orders and drummed me out of the poetry writing world. So when I was visiting the urban department, looking for the notebook uh, of the, uh, the poems written in James Dickey's class, I stumbled across the notebook and in the margin, um, Pat had left poetry and in the back of that uh, notebook started to write, a a short story and in the margin it said find the rhythm of your language and stick with it so he uh, learned that a poet could write fiction from Dickey because deliverance was out um, and you know he started to really think about what he could authentically write what prose what fiction he could write and um, and around that time, mom invited uh, Pat to speak at the O Officers Club on Paris Island. And Pat was supposed to speak about the Fusky, his experience, the water is wine. But he goes to the officer club and he talks about the secrets of, that military wives often have to hold on to about the abuse they're suffering from their husband. And don't let it happen to you. Don't let it happen to your kids. And half the room is angry as all get out and half the room come up, comes up to them and thanks them for the talk. Dylan Thomas, 1914-1953, excerpt from the Almanac of Time. The Almanac of Time hangs in the brain, the seasons numbered by the inward sun, the winter years move in the pit of man, his graft is measured at page of pain, shifts to the red wound pen. So he shifts to write something authentic, and he goes in to the pain of our family. So I think he leaves the writing of poetry and zeroes in like a sharp shooter on the story. To me, um, I think he was born to tell. A story about a fighter pilot, a story about uh, um, Mary Ann's, the Carol, my sister's character in the, in the book, Mary Ann's search for validation in a patriarchal family is on display. He writes an excerpt from the great Santini. Of course, his prose is poetry. Can a boy begin a prayer with the hatred, hatred of his father in his heart? Can that boy walk up to the altar of God and can he lay that hatred out? Can he spew his hate and tell his story? Can he tell about the beatings and humiliations? Can he tell of the Marine who stormed the beaches of his childhood? Can he look into the eye of God and spit into that purest source of light for engendering his soul in the seed of a father who did not know the secret of tenderness, a father who loved in strange, undecipherable ways, a father who did not know how to love, a father who did not know how to try? My sister would write um, in, the book, in her collection of poetry, The Beauty Wars, The Fighter Pilot, an excerpt. The stars are colder than my father's dreams. At 30,000 feet, black sheep maul and constant shepherds, less the wind. Stand by for pilots, the dipper points. The war is over and the conflict has begun. Excerpt. From Of History and Hope by Miller Williams. We know the sound of all the sounds we brought. The rich taste of it is on our tongues. 
but where are we going to be and why and who? The disenfranchised dead want to know. We mean to be the people we meant to be, to keep on going where we meant to go. Pat would write after he completed the great Santini that he needed to be around other writers and books. So he attends his first writing conference and he um, it's in Atlanta at the Colin Wall Fine Arts Center. Uh, and he, he goes into a poetry workshop led by the famous feminist poet, Adrian Rich, the uh, author of Diving Into the Wreck. Uh, and unknown to Pat, Rich had kicked out all the men um, out of her workshop. So he walks in and all the women hiss him out of the room. And other just hilarious stories sort of ensue from that, that first workshop he attends. But what happens is um, Miller Williams, who is Lucinda Williams, his father, um, you know, does a reading at the workshop and dedicates the reading to Pat. And of course, Miller would uh, read um, at President Clinton's second inauguration. Excerpt from Dunkirk. It's a photograph of my mother and Pat. She looked at him and he looked at her. They were English children born and bred. He frowned her down, but she wouldn't stir. She shook her proud young head. You'll need a crew, she said. Mom and Pat were crewmates. You know, mom died early. She died at 59. And she died of leukemia. And Pat would read poems like this poem uh, by R Robert Nathan, too to her uh, in the hospital room. He would use this poem at Beaver High School and taught this poem as well, an incredible poem. An excerpt from Phosphorescence of My Mother into the Quick of Fox each November by my sister Carol. Your breathing roughed, tore, my ear undreamed your mouth, I kissed a flame. With fingertips lush as fur, I stroked your face, stay. The death of my mom would sort of unhinge Pat for a while. But, you know, one of the things he would do is use poetry uh, to comfort himself for solace. He would ask Carol um, to participate in writing two poems for the Prince of Tides. But Carol kind of caught wind of, you know, the character in the Prince of Tides, Savannah Wingo, and how Pat was sort of betraying uh, a little bit too much of Carol's reality in that character. And so Carol refused to write uh, any of the poems for the book, either two poems. So Pat wrote both poems that ended up being in the Prince of Tides. Uh, and here's the poem he wrote um, called Savannah's Poem, um, read by Confidence of Mina. Savannah's poem from the Prince of Tides. I blaze with a deep, sullen magic, smell lust like a heron on fire, all words. I form into castles, then storm them. With soldiers of air, what I seek is not there for asking my armies are fit and well-trained, this poet will trust her battalions to fashion her words into blades at dawn. I shall ask them for beauty, for proof that their training went well at night. I shall beg their forgiveness as I cut their throats by the hill, my navies. Advance through the language, destroyers ablaze in high seas. I soften the island, the landing. With words, I enlist a dark army. My poems are my war with the world. I blaze with a deep southern magic. The bombardiers taxi at noon. There is a screaming and grief in the mansions. And the moon is a heron on fire. Man wonders, but God decides when to kill. Prince of Tides. Sadly, um, you know, and, and painfully, my 
I'll tell you this, my brother committed suicide in 1994. Uh, Pat called um, uh, and read this poem, excerpt from Wild Geese by Mary Oliver. You do not have to be good. You do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. Tell me about despair, yours, and I will tell you mine. Meanwhile, the world goes on. Beach mu music would be published a year after Tommy's death. The inscription, uh, the book is dedicated uh, this way. Uh, to my three wonderful and irreplaceable brothers, Michael Joseph, James Patrick, Timothy John, loyalists and life sharers, and to Thomas Patrick, our hurt brother and lost boy. A Knot Admitting of the Wound by Emily Dickinson. A Knot Admitting of the Wound until it grew so wide that all my life had entered it and there were troughs beside. A closing of the simple lid that opened to the sun until the tender carpenter perpetual nail it down. Excerpt from Journey to Iceland by W.H. Auden. Tears fall in all the rivers against the driver, pulls on his gloves and in a blinding snowstorm starts upon his deadly journey. And again, the rider runs howling to his art. By pulling the bandage off on family wounds again and again, you know, Pat would go through many depressive episodes in his life. But happiness is on the way because he meets Cassandra King, um, his third wife, who he was really born to. They were born for each other. Cassandra King is a wonderful writer in his own right. You see their wedding photograph and you see who's pouring uh, the champagne there is Judge Sanders, who performed the wedding ceremony. So he finally meets the woman he was meant to be with. How the hell um, my father from Chicago and my brother both ended up marrying Alabama women, I'll never know. But being an Alabama woman, uh, her one character trait that she shared with my mother was very, she was very thrifty. And, and being thrifty, she would not buy Pat, who didn't need anything expensive gifts, but would give Pat scrapbooks. And she did this scrapbook for Pat on the 10th um, um, anniversary of their sort of uh, Christmases together. Um, believe it or not, this is our 10th Christmas together. We brought out two books and both had milestone birthdays. They have been many fabulous trips and well, as a few not so fabulous ones. We have lived through deaths and tragedies as well as many weddings and births, not always in that order. Many folks have come and gone in our lives. It has all been glorious. Let me say it again. It has all been glorious. I have no regrets. I love you with all my heart and soul, your Sunday wife. So uh, this book, a scrapbook would contain these two poems. I'll bring both of them are wonderful poems. Tree by James, Jane Hirschfield. It is foolish to let a young redwood grow next to a house. Even in this one lifetime, you will have to choose that great calm being, this clutter of soup pots and books. Already the first branch tips brush at the window, softly, calmly, immensity, Taps at your life, excerpt from The Messenger by Mary Oliver. My work is loving the world, here the sunflowers, there the hummingbird, equal seekers of sweetness, here the quickening yeast, there the blue plums, here the clam deep in the speckled sand. Pat would write in the South Abroad, the tide was a poem that only time could create, and I watched it stream and brim and make it steady, dash homeward to the ocean. At Pat's 70th birthday, we all got together at the first Pat Conroy Literary Festival and threw him a huge birthday party. And we surprised him uh, with um, the presence of Brawin Dickey, James Dickey's daughter, who came on stage and read James Dickey's great poem for the last Wolverine, 
and Pat mouthed every single word. And this is an excerpt of the last line, if you know the poem. Lord, let me die, but not die out. So shortly after that festival, about a month later, he would be diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. He, they did just what your family and every family would do. They went to hospital, hospital, looking to see if there was a viable treatment. Uh, he was too far gone. He couldn't tolerate aggressive chemo. Uh, eventually, the last hospital stop was in USC, and then they sent him home. And, um, you know, we just did what every Southern family does. You know, you gather, you pray, we read poems, uh, grabbing uh, the collections from his bookcases and brought them in to him. And so Ron Rash, a really dear friend of Pat, had just finished his new and selected collection and he mailed it, uh, Rush mailed it to Pat, you know, one day delivery. And whoever delivered it didn't sign that it actually had gotten there. And you can imagine there was just stacks of mail being ignored. But Ron really wanted us to find this book and take it in to Pat. And, and so he had the mailman come back and, and sort of say, hey, did, I forgot to scan this in. Let's look for it. So we got it. I opened up the book and, and brought it to Pat. And this is an excerpt from uh, one of the poems we read that day. An excerpt from The Call. That afternoon, as last light drained from the hospital window, he rose in the bed and called, not preacher, daughter, or wife, but for his two black and tans, as if they might keep at bay what hovered in the shadows. Excerpt from Atlantis by W.H. Auden. Stagger onward rejoicing, and even then, if perhaps having actually got to the last call, you collapse with all Atlantis shining below you, yet you cannot descend. You should still be proud, even to have been allowed just to peep at Atlantis. In a poetic vision, give thanks and lie down in peace, having seen your salvation. Excerpt from uh, Gerard Manley Hopkins' poem, The Wreck of the Deutschland to the happy, this is a, a epigraph at the top of the poem, to the happy memory of five Franciscan nuns, exiles by the Falk laws, drowned between midnight and morning of December 7th, 1875. I admire thee, master of the tides, of the your flood, of the year's fall, the recurb and the recovery of the Gulf sides, the girth of it and the wharf of it and the wall, staunching, quenching ocean of emotionable mind, ground of being and granite of it past all, grasp God throne behind, death with a sovereignty that heeds but hides, bodes but abides with a mercy that outrides the all of water and arc. In the last poem read to Pat by his good friend, Ellen Malfrist, uh, the U.S. Um, C. Um, uh, professor in, uh, at the Bluffton campus. Excerpt from Strength of Fields. The moon lying on the brain as on the excited sea, as on the strength of fields. Lord, let me shake with purpose. Wild hope can always spring from tended strength. Everything is in that, that and nothing but kindness. More kindness, dear Lord, of the renewing green. That is where it all has to start with the simplest things. More kindness will do nothing less than save every sleeping one and night waking, walking one of us. My life belongs to the world. I will do what I can. This is a book Pat was writing um, when he died, a fictional account of um, actually a uh, called The Storms of Aquarius. Um, and it is really based on that first two years of teaching at Beaufort High. In me, I felt the triumph of nothingness, even when I wished for the wildness of Rambo, the God nearness of Hopkins, 
the quiet divinity of Dickinson, the word drunkenness of Phil and Thomas, the vastness of Whitman, the easy perfection of Auden. I ask again, how does one become a writer? Choose the path of conviction. Seek those that teach with precision, passion, praise, kindness of love, Monte, Norris, Ellis, Duffy. Practice like a point guard with hands like wild birds. Read, read, read. Write, write, write. Practice, practice, practice. Persevere through failure and mediocrity. Discover the rhythm of your language. Quiet self-criticism and find inspiration from the beauty of the natural world. Friends, poetry, and literature. Help an aspiring writer out whenever you can. This is the work that we carry on for Pat at the Pat Conroy Literary Center to form supportive communities of readers and writers and encourage all to say the great yes at any stage of your life. If you would, wherever you are near your computer screen, if you haven't left or, uh, or have had too many Bloody Marys by now, please <laughs> read this poem with me and, and read it with, along with me. Thank you by Ross Gay. If you find yourself so half naked, and barefoot, and barefoot in the frosty grass, yeah. hearing Very again man. the earth's the great, great sonorous moon that says, you are the heir of the now, of the now and, gone, and gone, that says, that says all you love, you love will, will turn, turn to dust, dust and, and will meet you there. there. Do, do not raise your, your fist. fist. Do, do not raise your small voice, voice against it. Against and, and do, do not, not take, take cover. Instead, instead curl your toes onto the grass. grass. Watch, watch the clouds ascending on your lips. Walk, walk the through the garden, storm and splendor. Say, Say only, only thank, you. You. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all for look, listening for so long. To, and thank you all so much. Thank you. 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 Wonderful. Um, I invite everybody to unmute. Tim, are you are you um, open to questions? Yeah, I, and I'm sorry it took so long, and I try to time these things out, but you know, I I'm my own worst enemy. <laughs> Peggy, was this recorded? Yes. <laughs> yes, it was recorded. I tell you, Peggy and David, y'all did a wonderful job reading those points. I love y'all's voices. They were great. They did. Thank you. Well, Tim, what what this has done is I'm heading downstairs to my bookshelves, and the only thing I'm pulling off is poetry. <laughs> or, or Pat Conroy books. <laughs> a quickie renewal of the love affair. Thank you so much. Really. Yes. Can I make a comment? I this to me was a holy experience. Just just bathed in some kind of holiness, and that word can have many different definitions. And I think you are the river, Tim, that is passing this on and on and on. And you have cobbled together just an experience that touches each individual here that you can't know, but I hope you do know what an impact you have on each one of us and all the different life stories that come to our minds while we're listening to you. Well, you know, I, I really appreciate that. And, and, and uh, you know, it's so, one of the strange things about doing a PowerPoint over Zoom is there's no, I don't see y'all. All I see is the screen of the PowerPoint. So it's sort of a, you know, it's a real different, almost isolating experience. But, you know, in a, in a way with my ADHD head, it, you know, made me focus a little bit too. So, um, it, uh, but I really do appreciate that. I, 
you know, there's the, the lesson I hope that gets through, and, I, and perhaps I need to emphasize it more, is that any one of y'all can write. You just have to have that first, you have to say it to yourself. That first great yes has to come from within. And then it takes the work that goes behind that great yes. But you have to say that great yes. You got to have conviction first. Because isn't that true with any dream? Though any dream you've ever had, if you fear failure, if you fear mediocrity, and you don't have the courage to say, I'm just going to do this thing, whether I really stink at it. And Pat wasn't great at first. He had to work at it to get better. Um, you know, those are typical high school sort of efforts. Um, although I think there's there's loveliness to that Randy Randall form. There is Correct. there is loveliness. Tim, I had the honor of meeting your brother many, many years ago in a um I think it was a book signing event at a very unique bookstore in Atlanta. Um, I can't remember the name of it, but I have I became a Pat Conroy fan then, and now I'm a Tim Conway fan too. <laughs> <laughs> Tim, I was um, helping out at the book festival um, one year, and your brother Pat was signing and. What I was amazed at was the number of people bringing old, ragged copies that they had treasured for years. He would never stop signing, no matter how long it took. And he everything was personal to him. He talked to every single person that came through his line. Many, many people were gone, had bluffed and gone long before Pat did, because he was not going to let anybody go without him talking to them and signing for them. Nice. No, I, I think he was unique that way. You know, I would think he really wanted to connect in an authentic way with his readership. And, you know, let's, let's, let me tell you this. He would steal every story he ever was told, too. So <laughs> if they told him a good story, oh you know, thing, you know, he, he was going to use that for, you know, and if he, if he ran across some, uh, somebody's interesting name, he would use that. Too. I mean, he uh, he was funny with with names. Um, and and if you got if he got mad at you for some reason, he would put you in a book. You know, your name would go in a in a character that he did not like in a book. <laughs> anyway, he was really um, really close to um, my mom. You know, and that 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 whole um, you know, just think how young fifty nine is. Yeah. You know, just it, for her to, to, to die at 59, it was really, really doubly um, tragic because, you know, she had finally divorced my father, which they needed to years before that happened. Um, and she had remarried. She was living at Fripp Island um, and she was finally happy. And, you know, all that was cut short. You know, which was really too bad. But was, you know, you know how life is, and that's why we all have to, you know, help each other. That's right. Through, through it. Mm -hmm. Well, Tim, we are so grateful to you for doing this for us. It really was wonderful. Y'all be, y'all be good. Have a great day. <laughs> <laughs>